I'm offering you a word of warning. This is not an easy passage today. In fact, this is the passage that was picked last year for the exegesis ordination exam. This is a, an exam that lasts five days, and it, they always pick the hardest patches, passages to analyze, and this one is on the menu today. The good news is you will earn your brunch. This passage is the second parable in a series of three that Jesus will tell following his entrance into Jerusalem. You heard the first one last week with Sarah with the two sons in the vineyard. Our passage comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. And Jesus is speaking to the chief priests and the Pharisees. Hear now the word of God. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized the slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. And he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And they said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the, of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to harass him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. God, source of all light, by your word give you, you give light to the soul. Pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that our hearts and minds may be open. Amen. Mine. Mine is one of the first words a toddler learns to say. A word that will be repeated a lot and a lot. The discovery of the word mine is also a major milestone because once the little ones understand possession, they soon will be on their way to learning how to share. Some people never seem to get out of the mine phase. I'm sure you've noticed. And some people mistake the word tenant for owner, and that's when that's what goes wrong into our parable today. The tenants ignore the landowner. They want ownership of the property and at whatever cost, mine. My neighborhood had a little excitement a few weeks ago. I drove home and uh, the street that leads to my house was flooded with police cars, something we really don't see much in our quiet neighborhood. I later gathered, though this could be gossip, but it would make sense that it was an eviction situation. I have no idea who lived there, but it was quite a scene. Then for the next three to four days, all I saw were piles and piles of furniture and stuff thrown in the front yard. And then there were people rummaging through it all and picking what they liked and getting stuff out of mounds of stuff until a final cleanup crew got the rest. It sure got the neighborhood talking. In all the stuff I saw on the front lawn, I couldn't ignore that there were a bunch of children's toys, and that made my heart ache. 
as property rentals are becoming the thing in our little piece of paradise, I hear that more and more of these stories are happening. We know that some tenants just can't afford to move. We all know also that the housing world is a nightmare right now. But some tenants do ignore their role as tenants. They act as if they were the landowners. Mine, they say. When I was 14, after living all my young life in this beautiful and large home in the best neighborhood of my hometown, my parents faced a personal bankruptcy. They had bought our home in the mid-70s with a variable mortgage rate, and it came back up for renewal in 1982. Not a great year, if you will recall. I seem to remember my dad saying that he had to pay around 20% interest on the loan. His mortgage then was about as high as mine is today. So they both worked like crazy on top of his university teaching position, my mom raising three of us, and then a few years later, they just couldn't make the payments anymore. So they, and they being the bank, I guess, took our home, our home, mine. And not only the home, the bankruptcy meant that they came to take everything we own of value, they took our fancy cars, and don't be jealous, but we had a gold Cadillac. Yes, they took most of the furniture except some basics and the house, of course. My parents managed to convince them, even though it was a little lie, that our 1908 upright piano was a gift to me from my grandmother, so I was able to keep it. So I was on an extended field trip with my school the week of the move. It was good because I kept imagining myself holding tightly onto a tree when it would be time to leave, thinking that it would have to physically remove me from the poverty by force. This house was mine. I'm glad I did not provide my parents with more embarrassment than needed. So just like that, I went from my large childhood home to a small apartment behind the mall where we had access to many buses that went many routes now that we had no cars, sharing a room with my little sister, ew, and having to give away my 12-year-old dog because there could be no pets in this new place. Oh, and my parents divorced in the process. And all this launched a series of yearly moves, basically until I finished college. Now, this might sound like a very sad story, and it wasn't pleasant at the time, for sure. But I can guarantee you that this was the best thing that happened to me. I learned so much from all this. I really learned that I don't own anything. And even when we think we do, apartments, homes, cars, land, children, family, and friends, there's really only one owner. They all belong to this amazingly loving and wonderfully generous God. So I learned to look at everything in gratitude and to appreciate everything I have, the people and work and all the things, because it has been loaned to me for an undetermined amount of time. The more we think mine, the more we focus on what we own, the more possessive we are, the less inclusive we want to be, and the less we share with others. When we grow in our field with a mine attitude, then we end up keeping for ourselves. The more we think mine, the less we focus on gratitude, the more protect protective and guarded we become. I recently read a short essay by E.B. White in the book, The Second Tree from the Corner, and it talked about Mrs. Winkus, who in the 1950s was arrested by the Newark police. She was deemed disorderly. Her problem, according to the law, was that she would sleep in two carton boxes in a hallway, making herself all compact and wearing all the clothing that she owned. She was a hard-working woman doing housekeeping for a living, and the bank account notes found on her showed a balance of nearly $20,000, and this was in the 50s. 
She was blamed for lacking habitation. She had the means to rent a room, but she didn't want to have to own coat hangers and a soap dish and a rug that collects dust and a vacuum to remove the dust and a desk to hold bills, including the bill for the installments on the TV that showed all the bad news of the world. Mrs. Winkus had her affairs in order and yet she was arrested for being disorderly. She wanted her mind to be as little as possible. I was introduced to the possibility of a position here at Church of the Palms in early 2013. After a couple of meetings with Pastor Steve, I came to visit this church on a Sunday morning. And that Sunday, I remember hearing something that floored me. My jaw dropped to the ground. The church was doing a reverse offering. Wow, who does that? The church was doing a reverse offering. People were leaving the church with cash in their hands. We were hearing stories of the fruit of this project that day. I just had never heard such a thing. A church that gives money back to the congregation to go and bear fruit with it. This was so wild and bold. I immediately knew that this place was unique and just really listening to the spirit. And we know that this church produces much fruit and that is shared with so many. And yet, and yet, in all churches, including this one, we can see at times that we can get an attitude of mine. Committees have been known to say, this is our way of doing things, or this is our building, or this job belongs to this person. The more we get involved, which is what Jesus calls us to do, the more we can feel ownership in the church. Mine even exists in this place. We bear the best fruit when we listen to how the Spirit wants us to tend to God's beloved church. So in life, right, we do what we're supposed to do. We work hard, we acquire land and stuff. We buy a house or three, pass it down to our kids. But for as long as we think that we own it all, we can become like the greedy tenants of this story. We hold on to what is not really ours, believing that it is. We forget about the big picture. We arrive into the world with nothing and we depart this world with nothing except for the fruit of our labor. At memorial services, we hope that the focus will not be on the departed and their possessions, how many houses and cars they owned, but more we want to hear about touching stories about the person's character and their generosity. We want to hear about how they tended the garden. Jesus used this parable to show God's incredible love for his vineyard and to warn that God's own son would be rejected and put to death. Jesus was now telling the chief priests and the Pharisees what was to come. And did they listen to this story? No, Jesus was still put to death. In the parable, he quoted Psalm 118 as he recalled a stone that had been rejected the stone that was so strong that the weight of the word could rest on this very stone and never fear anything. The cornerstone. Well, my husband and I visited Donnelly Castle this summer, about a mile north of Oban, our favorite little town on the west coast of Scotland. Our guide was named Jamie, and we debated back and forth whether it was his real name or if he was going after the main character of the series, Outlander. Jamie talked about the current owners, the, the McDougals, the clan's name that has owned the land for centuries. And we walked by their house at the foot of the castle ruins, a house that was built in 1746 and later added on to. The family continues to tend to the beautiful grounds and they live there peacefully, even as tourists like us walk by to visit their old ruins. So as a significant part of Jamie's guided visit had to do with the castle rocks. 
After the castle was abandoned in 1745, only the cornerstones were reclaimed to build a house that they still use today. Even then, there was just something really important about these stones. The cornerstones back in the Roman times was the main foundation of a structure, and it was the first stone laid, the strongest stone. It was going to support the whole building. It had to be just the right size and right proportion. The stone was key to the building process, and it was the one rock placed strategically on which all the rest would lean on. And it had to be angled just right, and the rest of the construction would take its shape from that very stone. The significance of the cornerstone might escape us a little bit today, but it was a very important symbol. First Peter chapter 2 says, Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. Jesus, the cornerstone, the one that God rightfully called mine, first rejected, but now the one through whom we live and prosper. You see, God has this burning, burning passion for us, a passion that's so powerful and so selfless that even the suffering of God's own son was offered to us as a gift so that we may live as fruitful people, so that we may receive mercy and grace. We received this land, this life, the people around us. It's our turn to tend to the garden in this portion of time in history. Whether we live 30 years or 100 years, we have all this time on our hands to do something to bear fruit, to multiply the goodness we've received and to ensure we won't be remembered just for our resources, but for the fruit that we brought to this world. So this hard parable can hopefully send us home thinking very hard on our attitude toward what we own and how grateful we are for all of it and how we make it prosper in everything we do. What about that relationship that's broken? What about these words that we wanted to say to someone but we just never do? Let's return all we have received in perfect order. Thank you, God, for this life that is filled with goodness. Thank you, God, for placing in our hands such precious children, dear friends, parents, spouses, and the strangers that change our lives. Mine to thine.